partnerships. And one of the uh, judging panel for the poster display. I hope everyone's had a chance to look at the posters, which you can get to see on the portal. So we had a very difficult job to do um, because all, all six posters were a very high standard. Um, and congratulations to everyone who submitted. Uh, we developed our criteria, which were cr clarity of the poster, design, evidence and referencing, and novelty. And you'll see if you look through the posters that they're three from the same stable, really, the Commonwealth Partnership for Antimicrobial Stewardship. Um, a very, very important topic and something supported by the Fleming Fund, UK Aid and THET. So these were very good, detailed um, posters on a very important topic. The fourth one was from the University of Cambridge, Universal Health Coverage in Sub-Saharan Africa, Implications for Planetary Health. And this was reporting on mainly a literature review um, and reporting on healthcare funding for universal health coverage. Again, very nicely produced. It uh, showed the SDGs and the way the literature review had been undertaken. We then had Flying the Flag for Physiotherapy, a uh, clinical partnership developing between uh, Uganda Cancer Institute and two physios visited the Cancer Institute, had a look at um, how physiotherapy was de being delivered in the Institute and uh, developed some standards and an ongoing partnership with the Institute in Uganda. But the judges came to the conclusion that the final poster, the introduction of an admissions pro forma in a low resource setting, significantly improved documentation, uh, scored highest for us. And so it's a very nice, clearly presented poster. Um, it uh, is nicely designed. It gives the evidence that supports the project and it presents the results from uh, introducing a new admissions pro forma in a low resource hospital in rural Zanzibar. It also scored on novelty um, because we were una unaware of the HIPZ, which is Health Improvement Pro Programme for Zanzibar. I'm very pleased that Claire Long is a local Addenbrooke's doc doctor involved in the poster display. Also quite like the QR in the bottom part of the poster, which links to the HIPZ organization and charity. So the judging panel um, scored this poster highest. And I'd like to congratulate, um, I think we have Claire Long here with us today for winning the prize. And well done to all the entrants. Uh, we were very impressed. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much. Dr. Jewell, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to um, have to have been asked to talk a little bit more about the poster. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, is that, can you see that? Yes, that's fine. Thank Great. You. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to um, talk a little bit more about the project. Um, I'm not going to go over what we wrote in the poster, but give a little bit more of the background. So Health Improvement Project Zanzibar or HIPS um, is an organisation that was established in 2007 to improve healthcare in Zanzibar. It grew out of a friendship between a, a consultant urologist in the UK um, and a doctor in Zanzibar who'd worked together in their junior doctor years. And a, key, a central feature of HIPS's work is is that HIPS works in direct partnership with the Ministry of Health and with local staff. So the hospitals that HIPS work in are government hospitals with staff employed by the Ministry of Health and HIPS staff and volunteers go in to support the local teams and um, particularly focusing on aspects such as teaching, quality improvement and leadership and management. So um, I volunteered in the hospital in the north, Kivungay, for nine months in 2016 and 2017 and one of the projects I was involved with was this development of an admission pro forma. So the two hospital teams um, to come together for meetings every two months to discuss current issues at the hospital and share kind of experiences and ideas for best practice. Um, the first meeting I attended, I raised the issue that I'd noticed that documentation for new patients being admitted to hospital was, was quite variable and sometimes quite limited. And the teams agreed this was something that, that could be improved and they asked me to take this forward by designing an admission pro forma. 
So I went away and did some reading about it. Um, there's not much literature on admission pro formas in, in low resource settings, but there was some advice about how what's worked well in high resource settings. And I put together a draft and presented it to the management team at Kivunge. And then we kind of discussed it and they suggested some changes and then we presented it to the staff. So this is um, an example of, of the first draft of the pro forma. Um, its use was quite variable initially. Um, we noticed that some doctors were using it consistently and it was improving their documentation, but some weren't. So I went and had a chat with them all and we agreed on a couple of changes. Um, one was that the doctors receiving the patient on the wards rather than admitting them from outpatients would be the ones to fit with responsibility for filling in the pro forma. And we also identified a couple of clinicians who had been using the profile really well and, and felt that it was a useful tool to act as local champions and to promote the profile to their colleagues and also to ensure that there was always a ready supply available. And we noticed further improvements in our subsequent data collections about the quality of documentation with the full results um, available to view in the poster. So when I was invited to speak at this conference, um, I contacted the hospital manager at Kavunge, Dr. Dehai, who you can see on the right, um, to ask how the pro is doing a few years on. And he told me that it's it's still being used and it's now being used for, consistently for every patient who's admitted. Um, anyone who's worked in quality improvement will know one of the best indicators of success is that a project continues after the initial person driving it has left. So I was really delighted to hear that it's been really embedded in local practice. Um, and Nikki, my co-author and I, were really grateful for the opportunity to showcase our project at this conference because we think it really demonstrates the sustainable change that's a key priority for HIPS. And which always, we, in, in all of our HIPS's work, we've noticed that's always achieved most successfully when you combine the different complementary skill sets of the volunteers coming in with their different skill sets and fresh eyes and new motivation, combining that with the real deep cultural understanding and local wealth of local knowledge and experience of the Zanzibari team. So um, the judges quite rightly commented that they would have liked to see uh, Zanzibari authors included on our poster. And this has been a really useful thing for, for Nikki and I to reflect on. My experience of working in global health is that it's a constant journey in reflection, self-improvement, not always getting things quite right and resolving to do a bit better next time. And this is certainly one aspect that I regret having overlooked, but I'm certainly going to take forward and improve on. We think this was a bit of a missed opportunity to continue the spirit of collaboration and partnership, which is central to HIPS's work. And it's actually prompted us to go back to our Zanzibari colleagues to talk about how we can further disseminate the learning from this and some of our other projects. Um, and we'll be looking to publish a couple of papers as a collaborative effort with the Zanzibari team. So thank you once again for the opportunity to present. Um, I'd be delighted to discuss the project or HIPS's work in more detail with anyone who's interested. Um, so please do get in touch. Thank you very much, Claire, and uh, well done. Good work, and uh, please continue to, to get engaged with Cambridge Global Health Partnerships in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Tony, and apologies for calling you Evelyn. It must be your new hairdo. Um, huge congratulations to Claire on that poster prize. Now to our first speaker this afternoon. It's a real joy to introduce Dr. Tom Bashford. Tom is an NH. NIHR funded clinical research fellow and a specialist registrar in anaesthesia at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. He's part of the partnership between Cambridge University Hospital um, in Cambridge and Rangon in Myanmar. It's been so great to work with Tom on the working group for this conference and indeed the previous conference just over two years ago and I love hearing him speak. I think his insights are especially helpful as he manages to combine his academic research real vision for how global health partnerships can work with clinical practice whilst continuing to work as a jogging anaesthetist. I used to have that much energy. Tom, over to you. Thanks so much for that, Sarah. Um, let me share my screen. And hopefully you can now see the presentation and that's working. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so thank you, Sarah, for that. Uh, and with that introduction, bearing in mind who's coming to speak after, I feel like I've got a bit of, a bit to live up to. Um, so I hope I don't disappoint. Um, as Sarah said, I've been asked to talk about collaborating for impact. Um, and to sort of to set that scene, uh, I can't really start without talking a little bit about the work that we do in Cambridge that links the Yangon uh, Trauma Intervention Partnership with the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma. 
Um, so essentially site it was uh, started in 2013 funded initially through the tropical health education trust health partnership scheme and is based at yangon general hospital here uh, in myanmar and the point of site it is to try to improve the trauma care of patients admitted to yangon general hospital and that is in itself an exercise in collaboration so CITIP is really an umbrella organization for a set of mutually interdependent but closely linked um, partnerships across the departments of physiotherapy, orthopaedics, pathology, medical education, nursing, and anesthesia and ICU. And that was reasonably well established and was doing very well when in 2017 we were granted an NIHR Global Health Research Group in uh, neurotrauma. And really that gave us an opportunity to bring an academic element uh, to the trauma partnership to make some new colleagues in the neurotrauma area who we knew through the existing partnership but hadn't worked with very uh, explicitly and so it allowed us to try and pull these two uh, efforts together so that we're trying to drive clinical improvement through a multi-partite approach but also develop research capacity and do some meaningful primary research um, in the context of brain injury in a low-income country. Um, so that all looks like a, a sort of what you would expect to see in a conference talking about collaboration. And you can't really get away without having a slide full of people's logos. Um, and sure enough, we've, we've got one of those. So we're lucky in Myanmar that there's a thing called the Myanmar UK Health Alliance, which is an umbrella organization for which THET provides the secretariat function and is largely funded, I think, through HEE, Health Education England. And that helps us coordinate activities among a range of partners who are working in Myanmar. And as my sort of slightly cold Venn diagram tries to show is that what happens is that the business of trying to improve care and the business of trying to do research inherently overlap. Um, and the interlinking between all of these various organizations is quite significant. Um, we are funded uh, as CITIP through uh, FET money, which has come through UK aid, but also through uh, DFID Burma money direct through the Rangoon General Hospital Reinvigoration Trust. Um, we managed to then use some of our NIHR funding to support our CITIP activities and our CITIP activities to support our research activities through the NIHR. Um, and then the, the little EDC logo you've got in the bottom is the Engineering Design Centre in the University of Cambridge, which is actually where I'm academically situated. So we're sort of trying to bring clinical medicine, engineering thinking, and my particular research interest is in systems engineering and how it helps us understand care with this mix of um, uh, clinical and research funded and done by lots of different people. But the issue with those kind of lovely images of logos and funding organisations is that they sometimes slightly exclude the people who really matter, uh, which are our clinical colleagues who live and work in Myanmar and the patients and their families who are served by these healthcare systems. And one of the things I wanted to draw out of today's talk was that in our talk of collaborating and impact, uh, we mustn't forget that the very epicenter of all of the things we're trying to do is to physically make care better. I'm an anaesthetist uh, and so a lot of the work in global surgery and global anaesthesia is led through or was sort of shaped by the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery which has found that you know five billion of the world's eight billion population don't have access to safe surgery and anaesthesia when needed and so the scale of the deficit is completely breathtaking um, and in all of our good talk about collaboration, I don't think we should forget that the center of all that are these people who need care. Um, so I started thinking a bit about collaborating and what that means, uh, and as well as impact. And what I quite like is that within the definitions, there are both good signs of collaboration, uh, working jointly on activities and projects, but not necessarily quite so positive aspects of collaboration. And the same in a way goes for impact, that a marked offense, effect or influence uh, it can go in a good direction or a bad direction. Um, so clinically, we often think of collaboration being a good thing. You know, we have lots of people working together to come up with a good outcome. Um, and I like to think that the uh, on-call theatre and Adam Brooks and Theatre for Out of Hours, you know, works like a, a very jolly, happy ship collaborating for patient care. But the truth of the matter is that collaboration doesn't always go as we wanted it to. And lots of people have different needs, different ideas, uh, different aims of that collaboration, they want different outcomes, and it's not always a happy hunting ground. And as in clinical care, I think global health. So when we start thinking about impact and collaboration, you know, my epicenter is here at the um, biomedical campus in Cambridge. And if you think about the kind of impact we can have on global health, however important we like to think we are, the reality is that we don't have a huge impact. Um, 
And that impact which we assess, remember, is a very thin slice of the actual effect that we're having in the world around us. So the reports that we write for donors, the things that we try and publish, the nice reports that we see in the press, represent a very carefully curated slice of the things that actually happen as the res result of the work that we do. Um, now, when people talk about collaboration, you know, we're here at the East of England conference, and so we're thinking about how do we work better together? And the answer is that even as a huge coordinated group of people from a region of the UK, in terms of global health, we're still going to have a reasonably modest effect. But what we do start to see is that our impact probably widens, but the ripples get wider. And so the unmeasured impact of what we do probably increases as well. And with that increases the risk of doing harm. And that's a, a topic that I'd like to revisit a bit later. So when you think about the entire global health ecosystem, this is taken from a, a really good paper, I think in 2018 of people trying to map some of the global health actors. And this is a map of 200 transnational actors who are considered part of the global health ecosystem. And I remind you again in this image that there is no mention here at all of LMIC, healthcare providers, families and patients. These are all just the kind of funding bodies and, and people who define themselves as global healthy type people. Uh, and so you would hope that all of these people working together are going to have a really solid global impact. And again, the point for me, uh, as I've spent the last sort of 10 years involved in global health, is that very big impact is not always an entirely positive thing. And so I'd just like to spend a moment or two thinking about what that can mean. So we like to think about impact as going the direction of the thing that the problem that we've identified with our partners in global health. And a lot of the time that is grounded in patient safety or patient outcomes. But as within clinical medicine, within global health, there's an increasing recognition that we often cause unintended harm or economic adversity or social disruption. And to understand that, we probably need uh, a vision, a scope, a reporting framework, which goes beyond what we're used to doing in terms of uh, healthcare and healthcare improvement. So trying to assess the impact of what we do has individual and organizational and global uh, sequelae. And it also goes outside the, the realms of the care of the patients. So if I think about the impact that I've seen living and working in low income environments, um, the disruption to the local uh, economic system of huge amounts of aid money is really marked and then the impact that has on healthcare provision is itself very marked so if I think about when I used to live and work in Ethiopia I watched a colleague of mine who was an anaesthetist um, desperate to get his master's in public health because that would get him a job working for an NGO that would be paid in US dollars he'd out earn his clinical salary about threefold uh, and he wouldn't be exposed to the long hours and the difficult work of working clinically. So the global aid machine was essentially robbing the country of a very good, very well-trained anaesthetist uh, because it placed a greater economic imperative on someone to go and run a overseas funded HIV uh, public health program. And you can argue about the relative merits of that to the native healthcare system, but it's still exerting a huge effect. And the same is true, I think we're increasingly recognising that that is the same uh, question in terms of academic partnerships. And those of us who are in the research panel earlier on today uh, started to very gently touch on the power imbalances that exist within global health research. Now, there's no doubt that a, in my mind certainly, that a well-orchestrated, uh, well-intentioned, well-run, mindful research partnership has the power to do a huge amount of good. Uh, and it has the capacity to develop research ability in low income settings, which is a genuine force for good, both in terms of driving improvements in clinical care, but also providing opportunities for those clinicians. On the other hand, there is a risk that we perpetuate existing imbalances, especially when you have very august, very powerful global institutions who are setting the pace and the tone of the research that's done. And also they're answering to domestic funders who still want uh, impact reported in terms that they're used to seeing. So uh, I think we're a long way away from hopefully the, the short term global health experiences, the kind of cavalier, white savior, kind of cowboy uh, enterprises that were probably a feature of several years ago and are still present but dying out. Those that sort of virtue, sort of verged on the, the unethical and the illegal. Um, and we're getting to something better. So, 
to hopefully not ramble on too long. I think that we we are all very good at this idea of uh, a collaboration based on lots of different skills, uh, lots of different people from lots of different countries trying to affect the same aim. I think that we need to be incredibly mindful that the center of that effort remains explicitly the improving care of patients in the low income settings and that the impact that we gear our interventions uh, to achieve must be grounded in that with the recognition that everybody involved in those processes is going to have their own needs. So we need to write donor reports so that we get further funding. People need to publish because it's what keeps their careers going. Clinicians need jobs and uh, gainful employment and all of those needs have to be satisfied by global health work but the point of it all is the people who lack access um, to care provision. So as we think about collaborating for impact my uh, challenge to us as a community both uh, within Cambridge within the east of England and within the global health ecosystem is that we don't see collaboration as an end in and of itself and that remember it is only an effort to do what we do better more efficiently more effectively and that as we consider what impact means we remember that impact has pros and cons to it and that the ripple effects of what we do go far beyond the mechanisms that we use for monitoring them and that as we do more together, we have the opportunity to do great more good, uh, but we equally run the risk of doing a great deal more harm if that effort is not considered. Um, so with that, I leave you, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that come out of it, but uh, remind you, there is also a panel session later. So does anyone have any questions they explicitly want me to go over now, uh, either a fact or clarity? Um, and otherwise we can save the extended ones for the panel sessions uh, a little bit later on. So I'm just trying to see, I'm going to close down. I can't down see any in the box, Tom, but unless I've missed anything at this stage. Close down my share screen. There's a question from Edwin. Did okay. you see the current partnership model evolving? How do I see the current partnership model evolving? Yes. Um, I think what's going to have to increasingly happen is a emphasis on joint governance between high income and low income countries. I think what's happened today is that the um, the funding and the governance of partnerships has led has been grounded squarely in the high income countries, um, which to me exacerbates this power imbalance of, of a receiver and a donor. Um, what I think is gonna to have to happen is more of the governance, more of the money being jointly managed between those two partners so that it becomes a genuinely mutual enterprise. And I think what we also need to see is uh, a move away from partnerships where the predominant travel is of high income people going to low income settings to deliver interventions. And one in which there is a equal and of equally important travel of people from low income settings coming to high income settings not just to learn but also to teach and one of the things that Arthur picked up in our research panel is that there are, there's a huge amount we can learn from our LMIC clinical and academic colleagues that has to translate into the way that partnerships work so that they're genuinely two-way uh, enterprises and at the moment I think we're still a bit stuck in a paradigm where it's unidirectional. Uh, so let me just scan down here. Um, da -da -da, wondered with neurotrauma, uh, where you see prevention fitting into your project. Yeah, that's something we've talked about at length. Um, within the group, we have a explicit focus within the neurotrauma group. We have an explicit focus on public health prevention, and that's led through the Institute of Public Health. Um, we haven't touched on it in Myanmar just because we don't have a public health person within the partnership yet. Um, and I'm very aware of my own limitations as an anaesthetist that is not my field. Um, I think it's what we'll probably try and do as time goes on is to bring that group expertise within the neurotrauma group into other areas of the partnership where it's not quite got, i.e. Myanmar. Um, so it's work in progress and it's essential, but we're not there yet. Um, and then the, I think this one, Please state what has worked particularly well in terms of effective collaboration in your international projects. Um, 
So if I think about the clinical projects, I think what works very effectively is when you have a genuine friendship between the people that lead those two. Uh, if you imagine that, you know, if you think of, think of our pathology partnership within SciTip, within the UK and, and Myanmar, that what happens hopefully very quickly is that you have a really tightly coupled um, friendship, which then prompts a huge amount of kind of offline talk so that it becomes part of people's working life to be working on their their global health project from either side of that equation um, and it doesn't become this kind of episodic uh, process where it only happens when people are visiting one or another um, and then I think from the academic perspective what's worked really well is that we wrote into our group immediately that we would be able to fund research fellows in Myanmar who were then completely integral into the design, the delivery and the analysis of the research project so that they've owned it as much as we have. Um, and it also means that their needs and their wants have shaped both the research that we're doing and the way in which we've done it. Um, so I think that has kept it as a, a, a strong collaboration. Uh, Tom, uh, yes. just um gently encouraging you we um we're going to have the opportunity for some more questions yeah. uh, in the panel discussion um absolutely wonderful would you be kind enough to um conclude and introduce our next speaker please absolutely delighted um so yeah that's all from me uh, i'm very happy to take any of these other questions i'll keep an eye on the, the chat bar and we can take some more to the panel if there's time um Really nicely for me is to introduce Professor Peter Hutchinson, uh, who is the uh, PI for the NIHR Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma, so he's my boss. Um, he is also uh, the uh, Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Cambridge, an honorary consultant neurosurgeon at Addenbrooke's Hospital, and the Director of Clinical Research at the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Um, so yeah, Hutch has been the lead for all of the research work that I've been alluding to, um, and I really look forward to hearing more from him uh, in his talk, which is to follow. Much over to you. Yeah, great, Tom. Thanks very much. That's a, a great talk. Well done, and a real testament to the success of the group that uh, that, that that you've brought together with with, with the other fellows. So um, I, I'm going to really uh, just expand on on what Tom said and put the whole the whole group into perspective. So. Uh, yeah, the, the group is, is really designed to address the issue of improving the management of neurotrauma in lower middle income countries. What do we mean by neurotrauma? We mean in the context of this group, traumatic brain injuries. So this is trauma to the head from road accidents, assaults, falls, sporting injuries, and a pathway for a patient from the scene of an incident through hospital care to rehabilitation and integration into the community. And you know, these pathways are well established in the United Kingdom, but we were concerned about the deficiencies in, in other countries. Uh, this is an incredibly common problem. Trauma causes 14,000 deaths per day globally. About half of these are a result of head and traumatic brain injury. And whilst we focused uh, classically on high income countries, 89% of these injuries are occurring in the lower middle income countries. And this is a map from one of our collaborators, Tony Fugaggi. I love this map because when he shows the world, he shows the world like this. He shows Africa at the top of the world. And I think that's a really helpful message in emphasizing how important this problem is uh, in, in different parts of the world. If you look at some of the parallels, so the pre-hospital care system in the Eastern region, as many of you are as well, Matt, we have a very sophisticated major trauma network with access to trauma units, major trauma centers. Uh, this was a trial undertaken by one of my colleagues in the US in, in the, the trial was undertaken in South America. And what was striking that, you know, what we didn't realize is that perhaps the results were not so good, but only 45% of the patients actually got to, to hospital by ambulance. We all take CT scanning for granted. The nice guidance is there. It tells us who we need to CT scan. We're very lucky with access to CT. How does it work in low middle income countries? Well, it depends on whether there's a scanner available. It depends even on funding. And what we've learned is that here we can undertake serial scans to look at how blood clots evolve. But in many places, it's limited to one uh, scan per patient. And then we have the most amazing monitoring. This is the neurocritical care unit in Cambridge where we can measure brain pressure, brain chemistry, brain oxygen. But again, this is uh, not available, so we have to to think beyond that and can we actually manage 
raised intracranial pressure without this monitoring. And again, this was Randy's trial, which showed that you can manage patients very, very well without access to some of this fancy technology. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So what about surgery? Well, you know, this is the instruments that were used in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. Top left, you can see that these are some of the instruments that are still used across the world. There's, there's not been major changes. And we were setting up a trial. We wanted to do a randomized trial of, of bone flap removal in Zambia. And we sent out the protocol and we said, could you join this study? And he said, that's all very well. But what we'd really like is, is a sophisticated drill to undertake the surgery in the first place. So clearly it's getting the level right. And then equally important is the issue of rehabilitation. Again, something that is generally well provided in the UK, but some of the challenges that we faced. And Tom's been very much involved in, in trying to help address this as well. So one of the many fantastic things that the NIHR has achieved is the Global Health Initiative and now many global health research groups and units addressing various aspects of global medicine. And we were very privileged to be awarded the Global Health Research Group on Neurotrauma, which commenced in 2017. And that was really on the background of us arguing that this is a massive problem globally, that neurological injury is catastrophic and care is complex, and that if we're going to improve care, it needs to be in the context of providing high quality uh, data. So as part of the group, we have a number of close collaborators, which are shown here in the lower middle income countries, but we also have collaborators through registries with many, many countries, well over 50 now globally, but these are our, these are our key partners. And the group is divided into four themes. Uh, the first theme is, is really mapping and, and trying to understand the scale of the problem just to focus on a couple of the aspects of theme one. And, and I know uh, Tony Jewell mentioned this in the chat. One of our themes is in collaboration with public health. It's based in India and it is about prevention and it is focusing on helmets. So this is Lawrence of Arabia who died in a motorcycle accident in 1934. This is Hugh Cairns, a neurosurgeon in Oxford who then introduced the legislation for motorcycle helmet technology and this was my trip to Chennai in India, where you see the whole family on the bike, but only a dad is wearing a helmet. So we, we've got collaboration with uh, one of our fellow Synanthian Public Health to try and map the scale of this problem and, and what is the best way to try and introduce this legislation for helmets. Uh, the GENOS study, so this is run by uh, David Clark. This is emergency surgery for TBI recognized by the Lancet Commission. Tom mentioned that five billion people on the planet do not have access to surgical care. And these were the procedures that have been recognized, Global Surgery 2030, as must do, should do, and can do. And intracranial hematoma evacuation is up there as a should do procedure. So we set up the GENOS, we went out to many, many centers, greater than 30, uh, 50 countries, 137 teams. And how did we convince people to contribute? Well, we said, that if you contribute, you will become an author on the paper. And one of the amazing things now about publishing and PubMed is that everybody who participates can be a collaborator and they can be recognized by PubMed. And, and this has been amazing in engaging consultants, uh, juniors and students across the world in, in these initiatives. So the GENOS study is pretty simple. What we aim to do is look at the types of patients with brain injury, their baseline clinical characteristics, why they're having surgery, what surgery is undertaken, and their outcome compared globally. It's a multi-center prospective study, and it was open to any hospital in the world. And it was fantastic in terms of the collaborations that we were able to build with a lead investigator, really engaging the trainees and the students. And the GENOS study uh, is now completed, and we will be publishing that in, uh, early in the next year. Now. Uh, Tom has mentioned part of theme two, some of the amazing work that he's undertaken in Myanmar with systems engineering and looking at how we can map current pathways, how we can model the impact of a change to improve outcome. But we've also recognised that, as I said earlier, that some of the technology we take for granted is brilliant, but it's very expensive and it's difficult to access. So a big part of the activity of the group is 
to try and look at how we can introduce cost effective technologies to improve outcome for patients. And you know, how have we done that? Well, this is something you're familiar with. This is the CT scan, I mentioned it earlier, started off as uh, big scanners in hospitals. We now have a mobile scanner on the intensive care unit. There are now CT scanners in ambulances to diagnose stroke, but access is very difficult. And this is uh, the device called an infra scanner. This is a collaboration that we've got going in Colombia to see if we can use this handheld infrared scanner to detect blood clots very easily uh, in patients who we cannot access CT. One of the major problems with brain injury is the brain is swollen and we measure the pressure. We do that by putting invasive probes into the brain. Again, this is quite sophisticated, but we've learned that as a surrogate, you don't actually need to do that. You can measure the diameter of the optic nerve. You can do that using ultrasound. Again, that is uh, fancy technology, but we can really drill that down. And this is the Philips Dumafi, an ultrasound probe, relatively cheap, accessible and connected to a smartphone for the display. And again, this is something that we're, we're going to be uh, um, researching soon. Uh, Tom was uh, very modest in, in, in some of the, the work that's been going on that he's been leading in Myanmar, but I think this is, this is absolutely fantastic. The rehabilitation and the monitoring of unconscious patients. We know it is very difficult to access staffing to look after patients. So there is a program where you can actually look at the role the families uh, may play in looking after patients acutely, but also in terms of their, of their longer term rehabilitation. And one of the other challenges, how do we know that these interventions are working? How do we follow up patients? So the trials that we run in the UK, classically the outcome, we send out the outcome questionnaires by a post. We've learned that in many parts of the world that service does not exist. Many people do not even have an address. So we thought about what can we do? A lot of people have phones. We thought about smartphones, but actually what we've drilled down now is we have developed the technology to send a very simple SMS text message, develop that to patients and their relatives. We can send that at one month and three months to see how they're doing. This is something that we designed for Africa, but what we've actually learned is a lot of this technology can be transferred back to the UK. So we thought, well, that's interesting in Africa, but actually can we use this in the UK to improve our follow-up strategies? So we're actually gonna be starting that with Brandon Smith, one of our PhD students. And then finally, theme four is about how we can build research capacity beyond our current research portfolio. How do we map capacity? How do we train people to undertake research? We've pioneered this through surgical trials. So we've got a number of trials. This is funded through the HTA program of the NIHR. This is a trial of craniectomy where we take the bone and leave the bone up to, after taking out a blood clot. And you know, the NIHR initially focused on NHS practice, but this trial we took out beyond the UK and the top recruiter in this trial, we're, we're really pleased is Nimhans in Bangalore in India, who've randomized a large number of patients with the most incredible data quality. Uh, one of the, the, the data quality is right up there, one of the best of all the centers, both in terms of the CRF, but also in terms of the follow-up. And then to try and disseminate the the, the further outputs, we're collaborating with a number of other partners. We're collaborating with the BMJ uh, and really looking at the experience of, of conducting research in low middle income countries. And we've learned that the qualitative research methods are often a very good way of doing that. Uh, we've led a number of consensus statements. So this is on decompressive craniectomy. And we were very conscious to really have a low and middle income country uh, emphasis on this. And this was our statement in Elmix, and you can see there number six, that regional authorities should be encouraged to promote availability of neurosurgeons to care for brain injured patients. And what we've learned is really in terms of the access to care is the real deficiency in the number of neurosurgeons. For example, when we started, there were only two in Zambia. And it was a huge privilege to, to represent the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies at the World Health Assembly in Geneva. This was 2019. So this is uh, a forum which is uh, held by the World Health Organization. It involves 
practically all the health ministers across the world and chief medical officers. And this was a, a, a seminar that I went to on patient safety. Dame Sally Davis was there representing the United Kingdom. There were a number of ELMIC partners. And this was a chance to discuss the issues directly with health ministers to try and get them to understand the problem. And it is beginning to make an impact. You know, we have introduced a much better training program in Zambia. They are now going from two uh, to eight neurosurgeons. So finally, you know, academic output's been important. It's the way historically that our research is assessed. It's the way that the ref looks at us. But, you know, we need to go beyond that. And I think what's great about this conference is the word impact. And we see that as making a difference to patients. So beyond scientific publications, it is about advocating uh, globally. It is about us developing guidelines that are applicable to low and middle income partner countries. It is about the work that Tom's doing in service redesign. And fundamentally, it's about the next generation training and clinical mentorship, how we can uh, build research capacity. And what's also been fantastic is the number of students that have come to us in terms of their electives. And I think one of the biggest tragedies currently out of COVID is that the medical students are not currently able to do this. And we're, we're really hoping next year to, to get them back on track and, uh, and, and participating in these programs. So just to acknowledge colleagues in Cambridge uh, and beyond, uh, this was our launch uh, photograph. This was the, the launch, Evelyn is there. And this was held at Robinson College and it was just brilliant to get everybody together to kick this initiative off. So uh, thank you to many people and thank you again to the NIHR for, for not only supporting the Neurotrauma Initiative, but many of the other surgical initiatives that I think are, are beginning to make a real difference to patients across the world. So thank you uh, for the invitation. We may be a bit short of time, so maybe questions now or maybe questions at the panel at the end, uh, whatever suits. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hutchinson. I think we've got time for one really quick question that's come in from a medical student. Um, how, is the, how is it that they best communicate with you if they want to get involved? Is email still the best route? So um, it depends on your age. If you want to get hold of me, probably email. If you want to get hold of some of the younger ones, probably Twitter and the really young ones, Instagram. But um, Tom can send the email details or if Evelyn, maybe afterwards we could send my email address around and I'd be really happy to uh, to help the students. And we, you know, we have got some funding. We're really happy to help with electives. Thank you. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we will have a panel discussion after our final keynote. Um, so thank you both to Tom and to Professor, Professor Hutchinson for those really, really interesting insights. I think you will all agree we have, we have a huge amount to think about. We're going to very slightly uh, rejig the agenda and it, we will in a moment be moving on to our final keynote. Um, after that, we will have our panel discussion and then Susie will sum up using mural both days of the conference. It's now an enormous privilege to introduce our final keynote speaker this evening. Dame Sally Davies, we are delighted not only to have you with us here today, but that you've swapped your lofty view of Westminster in the Thames for a much prettier one of the CAM. We would like to welcome you to East Anglia, Dame Sally, and please don't forget to visit Suffolk. In addition to taking up her role as Master of Trinity College Cambridge last year, Dame Sally was appointed the UK Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance. She cares passionately about the health and well-being of everyone across the globe and has been driven to make our planet a better, safer, healthier and happier place. In recognition of this, she was last Friday awarded the Nelson Mandela Award for Health Promotion by the WHA. Today, in Sally's latest book, Whose Health Is It Anyway, is published. She describes how governments and societies can approach health as an opportunity, and I for one can't wait to read it. We last met in person in early February at Trinity. It was a meeting to discuss this conference, which as you all know was planned uh, for March. I remember that chilly day well. Um, we'd been keenly watching the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak sweep across the globe. And we all knew then it was going to be a major concern here as well. I remember asking her advice 
about what we should do with ongoing activities associated with the Fleming funded CPAMS program, programs which you've heard about today and which Dame Sally has been such an advocate. Soon after that meeting, we chose to halt the programme in order to allow our volunteers to focus on their domestic responses. Many of um, the UK, UK teams in particular uh, were running, managing the COVID responses in their own hospitals. However, the volunteers actually chose to step up communications um, with their partners at that time to support each other as we tackled this global threat. So whilst the projects have been impacted adversely by the pandemic, in some ways it's, it's ironic that that's precisely why these collaborations are so crucial and why this model of partnership works so well in global health. Leaders in the NHS have commented that the individuals involved in these partnerships were actually better prepared for the pandemic than many others. For example, an ability to think innovatively and quickly in a crisis, managing shortages of PPE, drugs, hand rub, or even just understanding the technology um, and uh, the need for meetings online when this happened almost overnight. This is World Antibiotic Awareness Week. There are many analogies between a disease circulating in communities with no treatment and no vaccine and with AMR. On Radio 4's Desert Island Discs, Lauren Laverne refused Dame Sally the ultimate luxury of an antibiotic to which resistance never develops. Apparently it wasn't luxurious enough. There would be no greater luxury. I have become rather obsessed with AMR over the last few years, partly as a result of working with the Fleming Fund, but also observing firsthand as a hospital pharmacist and as a patient, how we are running out of options for some infections right now in our hospitals. And there is a possible future where we have no usable antimicrobials, and it will be the most vulnerable and the poorest in society who will be hit the hardest by this. When we met in February, we explained we were trying to make this conference as near carbon neutral as feasible. And I think we've ticked that box um, even more effectively than we had aspired to. The reason, of course, is that we have a climate emergency. Dame Sally has told us AMR is a similar global threat. And there is still so much to do. And Dame Sally has set the bar high for the UK and globally and is using her influence to do something about it. Combining academic rigor with clinical practice to improve health and save lives. In an attempt to conclude with something moderately eloquent and thought provoking, I will unapologetically turn to the words of another splendid inspirational woman. She was actually talking about climate change but could equally have been talking about AMR. And unlike Dame Sally, this doctor has a time machine. Where we are now, this is one possible future. It is one timeline. You want me to tell you it's going to be okay because I can't. In your time, everyone is busy arguing about the washing up whilst the house is burning down. Unless people face facts, catastrophe is coming. But it is not decided. It depends on a billion decisions and people stepping up. Humans, I think you forget how powerful you are. Lives change worlds. People change planets or wreck them. That's the choice. Be the best of humanity. Thank you, Dr. He, for those words. And thank you, Dame Sally Davies, for speaking tonight. Over thank to you. Thank you, Sarah. That's um, humbling. And um, congratulations, all the organizers and everyone for such a great conference. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you longer on this theme, which I think impact for collaboration if we hadn't believed in it before, we absolutely would now. Um, COVID has shown us that you can only move forwards when you collaborate and when we get it right. And how wonderful to bring everything together. I went and listened to the AMR uh, session this afternoon, uh, but I've also been inspired by the work that uh, you've been describing um, from, uh, from Myanmar and some of the other things. It is 
fantastic. Uh, I was told about one of the partnerships with Botswana on eye health and how you've managed to help them develop a nationwide diabetic service and train three quarters of their ophthalmic nurses. And I think what I've also heard is what I know I experienced when I first met Eldred Parry, now Sir Eldred Parry of Thet, which is this is not a one way thing. We learn with our colleagues in low and middle income countries as we visit them. We learn about frugal innovation. We learn how to make do. We learn how to do things differently. And we bring back a personal learning, not only about that, but about ourselves and how would we do in the adversity that many of them face. And I'm watching with fascination as we see more South to South collaborations, and we're going to see much more South to North. One of the humbling things one of my colleagues said to me recently from Asia was, you know, Sally, we used to look to Britain for the uh, playbook when things went wrong, but on COVID, you should be looking to us. And all I could say was amen, absolutely right. So you've been doing wonderful work and um, it extends not only to implementation work uh, abroad and research abroad, but I, I understand that across the east of England, you've got a, an NHS collaborative procurement hub that works well. So collaboration is happening here. And that I think is fantastic to hear, to see, and to know it's, it's going to work. Um, because where we don't collaborate, things do fall through. And Sarah, thank you for mentioning our book, because what Johnny Pearson Stuttart and I realized as he edited my annual report in 2018 that came out in December of 2018 on what health could look like in 2040, was that health is our greatest asset, both as individuals, as communities and as nations, for happiness, but actually for economic prosperity. But then as you explore it, what we all learn is that health isn't a silo. It's not our health system that protects our health. That is in Britain, an NHS which focuses particularly on illness and does a phenomenal job. And thank you NHS and all NHS workers for what you've been doing in COVID and broader. But our health is driven by the social drivers, which we know, but it is also driven by the commercial drivers. And in this country, though we've paid attention, particularly to tobacco and somewhat to alcohol and with the sugar levy, we have a lot more to do about that. But you can read the book, if you can get hold of it, it was launched today. I haven't received a copy at all. And Amazon say they, aren't, uh, they can't deliver for a while. So read it and enjoy it when you can get it. But let us think a bit more about what it is in our system that makes it easier to work in silos. I don't think it's unique to Britain. And they're tribal issues, they're philosophical problems. I enjoyed listening to a behavioral scientist but it's only recently we've brought behavioral science into our mainstream. And I think we're going to have to bring science of all sorts much more into what we're going to do, whether it's the genomics into our national screening program that we need to do, or whether it is um, behavioral science into implementation, modeling into our delivery and our logistics. So we need a broader concept of science, and that will mean collaboration. And we've got to, if we're going to collaborate, start to think through trust and about the depersonalization of data. I'm going to talk to you in a, in a short while about the, a project that I've set up. And it was um, the head of Microsoft Health who, introduce me to this new concept. It's not about confidentiality. It's not about privacy. It's about depersonalization of data. So you can't go back to it. Because if we don't 
look at the data, how are we going to need to move forwards? And we've got to have better access to depersonalized data, as well as the data on individuals following them throughout their care and uh, treatment and out into the community so that they get the best deal. So I would argue, and I think you would agree, that collaboration in health in Cambridge and beyond is a necessity, not a luxury. And um, that then took me, when COVID started, to thinking, so what are we doing? And clearly, we've been involved as a nation in the here and now, the hurly-burly of trying to make it work, the pain of trying to get decent PPE, trying to get a test and trace system that works, and everyone absolutely putting their best into it. But what I saw was that all going on and um, a fantastic effort, but very few were standing up above and saying, hang on a minute, what should we be learning now that means we would do better another time? We need to be at the same time as facing into this situation, facing out and saying never again. We've got to identify the health threats better. We've got to catch them before they become epidemics, let alone pandemics. And if we do get, not if, when we do get more pandemics, how are we going to respond so that we protect not only health, but our social and economic um, uh, issues, and on top of that, recover in all those ways. How do we do better? So what we've done is draw together a unique collaboration of actors uh, under the banner of the Trinity Challenge. And these actors are academics from across the world, and Cambridge University is one, with private sector from across the world. Because we've got to ask ourselves the questions of what are the critical lessons we learn from this crisis to embed for the future? How do we collaborate across sectors and geographies, invest in innovative solutions? What data matters and who holds it? And as we explored questions like this, we realized that you could argue that health systems and perhaps governments hold some data, health data, but to respond effectively, we need data about logistics systems, social data about expenditure, about movement, economic data, behavioral data, relating data of mandates by governments and authorities to outcomes and what people are, how people are behaving and then what that does to our health outcomes or our economic outcomes. And if you believe, as I do, that that is all important data for response, then you can see we have to involve and bring in the people who hold those data. And that is the private sector. We also need to recognize that our wonderful public health people have not been um, at the forefront of data science and where machine learning, artificial intelligence is going. And we need to bring all of this together. Just as, to go back to what I was saying about South to North learning, the solutions we need could come from anyone or anywhere across the globe. And we really need true boundary spanning insights from everywhere. So we launched in um, at the beginning of October, the Trinity Challenge. We've got the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to GSK. We've got Cambridge University to McKinsey's. We've got Tencent in Hong Kong, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, all offering some open data, some data to people who are working on the Trinity Challenge um, on request, and then privileged access to the other data that they hold as part of a ch 
Trinity Challenge working team where they are working with and supporting. We've got 22 founding members. There are some philanthropists in there, some NGOs, a wonderful one called Internews, who are focused in the everyday on getting, I'll call it true news, through to 75 hard to reach countries. They're working with Facebook at the moment already on a, on a piece of work about how do you put over messages so that they're heard, trusted, and acted on. Um, and for Facebook are extraordinarily excited about this and they're working very well. Um, and there's lots of work already going on. We're trying through this challenge to bring in innovation using data. And we haven't involved governments, though many of them are aware and supportive and they're talking to us. And we do have the support from the WHO. As well as um, launching the new challenge, we're facilitating unique collaborations and doing some think pieces. So it's a very exciting, and do look at our website, the trinitychallenge.org. But as you heard, if you didn't know, one of my passions, or perhaps you could say my other work passion is about antimicrobial resistance. We need to work to get equitable, accessible and appropriate antibiotics to all of all who need them. And that's why I enjoyed the stewardship discussions. Um, and um, it was a great session. Thank you, Edwin, James and Atia. Here we are at the beginning of World Antibiotic Awareness Week. So I want to add a metaphor to your session this afternoon. I've been talking about how COVID is the lobster dropped into boiling water. For those of you who haven't done it, let me tell you, as they die, they make a dreadful racket. It's very noisy. I think antimicrobial resistance is the slow, silent pandemic where the lobster is put, as the RSPCA tells us to, into cold water and heated up very slowly. It doesn't make any noise. And that is what's happening and people don't seem to understand it. Well, perhaps they do, but we need much more action for impact, don't we? I mean, at the beginning of this year, the WHO published its 13 biggest health threats for the 2020s. Guess what? One was a pandemic and another was AMR. And here we are with both of them. We know that AMR is impacting already. Um, over 700,000 people dying every year across the globe, with over 200,000 dying each year from multi-drug resistant and extreme drug resistant TB, a rise in resistance to first line HIV drugs, to artemisinin um, over in Southeast Asia for malaria, and in India, 60,000 newborns dying every year of drug resistant sepsis. It is a tragic and dreadful story. So if it can really have this impact now, and we know that from the World Bank study that if we don't take action, we're going to drive an extra 28 million people into extreme poverty, then we've got to start to act much more. And we know it in uh, um, antimicrobial resistance increases hospital stays, increasing complexity and cost, but it also doubles the mortality generally of patients. So we need to take this opportunity of COVID and people learning about infection prevention and control and try and embed it everywhere so that we do prevent infections, whether it's flu, whether it's COVID, whether it is bacterial, that then mean people don't need antibiotics. We need to conserve our antibiotics. And I was thrilled by the Commonwealth Pharmacists Exchange Programme that was funded by the Fleming Fund and uh, Sarah has led. I think that's done wonderful things. So we have to remember that we've got to improve access of antibiotics to low-income countries, but then help everyone make sure that stewardship 
is in place. I'm not depressed, I'm optimistic. Probably I've always been glass half full, but um, globally, you know, this year uh, in January, the Indian government, for instance, published a draft act that they uh, would put in place uh, environmental safe levels for their factories um, because many of their factories, as they make antibiotics, spew masses of antibiotic out. Meanwhile, China has said, and they don't need laws, do they? They just say, and then it happens that um, they are phasing out uh, by the end of the year antibiotics just in um, chicken feed and fish fa uh, farming feed. Because of course, that's what happens in a lot of the world. The people go to their farms, whether intensive or small local farms, they tip out the feed for these animals or fish and the antibiotic was in it. They don't know that that's what they're doing. It needs removing so that antibiotics are only used to treat sick animals or sick fish. So I've mentioned the Fleming Fund. Let me finish by bringing it up again. I mean, it is a part of our UK aid. It's the first um, major international aid investment dedicated to addressing AMR with data at its heart. And I'm thrilled by what we've managed to fund. To date, we've got over 22 country grants and fellowships across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, developing country capacity to tackle drug resistant infections. And I think data has to be at the center of action. I saw that this afternoon's session on AMR. And interesting projects in Bangladesh, the health professionals are collaborating with WHO to produce guidelines on responsible antibiotic use while the Food and Agriculture Organization are working with vets in Bangladesh using Fleming funding to pilot a mobile app to use uh, to optimize prescription practices for poultry. I mean, when they get this right, it can be expanded to other countries. It's fantastic. So what the Fleming Fund has been funding is in part things that come under the Cambridge Global Health Partnerships and similar to other things that you're doing right now. I think we need more of this and more collaboration. That doesn't mean it's easy. Collaboration means listening. Collaboration means shifting and compromise. It means challenges and you have to think differently beyond the realms of our own research. But hey, we heard exactly that from Tom this afternoon. We can do it and I'm thrilled that I have come here to Trinity at the heart of such a vibrant global health community that's looking outwards and collaborating in Cambridge, in East England and across many countries. So I would argue we all have a role to play for whatever reason we are here to do. So thank you. And remember collaboration starts at home and then it goes abroad. I'm thrilled you're doing this and congratulations for a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dame Sally. Really interesting and insightful talk. Um, I think we've, we've, we've just, we're all really, really fascinated to hear what you, what you have to say. Um, what we thought we would do now is move straight on with our panel discussion. I know you have, um, uh, you're going straight to your next, your next uh, meeting after this. <laughs> um, so without further ado, we will move straight on. Joining Dame Sally, Dr. Tom uh, Bashford and Professor Hutchinson, we're delighted to welcome back Dr. Stephen Baker. Steve is a molecular microbiologist within the Department of Medicine at Cambridge University and he was based at the Welcome Africa Asia programme in Vietnam for 11 years, um, where he established a programme of work on enteric uh, GI infections, which has been, the work has been closely linked um, <clears throat> with other work with the University of Cambridge and the Sanger Institute. Steve is also the co-lead for the global health theme of the new Cambridge Public Health IRC, 
uh, and he presented on uh, part one of our conference on the 9th of uh, November. So we're delighted to have you back. Welcome to the rest of the panel. Um, and if I may start, Dame Sally, with a question for you. The conference theme is collaboration for impact. What are your suggestions on how we can better collaborate for impact? And what impact do you think we should be monitoring? I think you want to meet. Um, I bet you all know the answer to that better than me. I mean, impact, it depends what you're doing. If you want to do research that's having an impact, are we, and, and Tom actually put this very well, are we trying to feed the ref in most of these global collaborations? You want to take note, but what you're trying to do is move the subject forwards. But how are you then going to translate it into making a difference going forwards. And I actually thought that Professor Hutchinson talked rather eloquently about that and how if you involve the researchers who are, have their feet in the service, then you're much more likely to embed the findings as you go forwards. So I think you've got to define what impact you want and then look to how to work across that collaboration to make it happen. And you've had some good examples in this conference. So I, I'd let the experts answer it, not me. Would anybody like to chip in? You three. <laughs> you want me to, to go? So, uh, yeah, I agree with, with, with Dame Sally. So I, I just, uh, there's a few, probably three points that I'd like to make. I, I think it's about networking and hubs and making sure that leadership is international. So what we've learned is actually, we started driving a lot of this from Cambridge, but for the renewal of this group, we're actually canvassing the Elmic partners to lead many of these projects and come up with the, the research question. So that's the first point. The second is a real focus on collaboration driven by trainees. And that's that happened in the UK. The trainee collaboratives have been absolutely amazing in driving their own research. So to try and get the trainees in, in the Elmic countries engaged in, in getting their own projects uh, up and running. And then you talked about what impact should we be monitoring. So, you know, this isn't about fancy scientific output. This isn't about publishing in, in nature. This is about making a difference to health policy and improving outcomes. So I think we need to look at a different way of measuring impact. And it's a challenge. How do we measure access to healthcare? And how do we actually show we're, we're making a difference? And there is, there is a trick with some of these new technologies to do that. I'm really pleased the ref's changing because I think it helps us. It particularly helps surgery. And because I think what we can do can make a difference quite quickly. So, uh, yeah, policy guidelines and then and then Dame Sally made this really important point about access to data and, and, and I think that's something that we need to, to address as well yeah thank you very much um did anybody else want to come in on that question or we could otherwise move on um so the only the only point I'd like to add to that Sarah and it's sort of maybe it's the cat amongst the pigeons I'm not sure is that we are very good at measuring the impact that we want to see. But I think also maybe we should build into more of our studies trying to measure the impact that we either didn't intend or would be going against what we want to achieve. So in the same way that, um, uh, you know, we, you, we, sort of, we do risk assessments for our research and for our clinical collaborations. And uh, I think it's sort of beholden on us not just to be looking for the, the good outcomes, but we should build into those looking for the bad outcomes to make sure we're not only steering in the direction that we want, but we're not steering in the direction that we don't want to be in. So that if we get a sense that we are either deviating clinical practice locally away from something that's already safe and established, or if we're pulling clinicians away from the service because they've been dazzled by the products of research and that's to the detriment of the local service, we should know that in real time and not find out about it later. Thank you, Tom. Um, before we move on to question two, we're going to have a very quick poll. Um, Charlotte, if you wouldn't mind putting the poll up. Um, and I'll give you about 20 seconds or 10, 15 seconds to fill that in, if you would be kind enough.
Thank you. Um, and then we will move on to our second question. How do we develop and achieve genuinely equitable partnerships, both regionally, i.e. not just Cambridge, but across the region and internationally and involving both academia and clinical practice? Um, and I wondered if Professor Hutchinson and then Dr. Baker would like to start with those two, please. Yes. Yeah, so thanks very much, Sarah. So equitable partnerships. So as I think I've already alluded to this a little bit in the answer to the first question is making sure that the scientific, the questions and the research that's driven is, is equal between us and ELMIC partners. And I, I was really pleased. We've just put in the renewal for the group and the NIHR have insisted, and this is absolutely right, that there is now a, there's two leaders to each of these. There's a, a UK leader and, the, and then there's an ELMIC partner leader. And, and I think that's been really, really important. What we did for the renewal is we we we, had, we said we're going to renew this. So we went out to the partners and we said, you come up with the projects and then we got all the projects. So actually all these research questions have come from, from them uh, in terms of their, their local priorities. And then finally, we talk about the trainees exchanges and the trainees coming, you know, we're going out there, they're coming here. But what, what, what I think has been amazing is what our trainees are, are beginning to learn. If you want to learn how to, clip an aneurysm, a cerebral aneurysm now, one of the best places to go is India because the technology has changed. A lot of it's done by radiology here, but if you want to learn microvascular surgery, you can go to centers in India where they have fantastic teachers, microscope technology, and you know, a lot of our trainees are, are going out to do that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baker? Yeah, so, I mean, just to echo what's been said already, really, there's, a, there's an enormous wealth of knowledge and experience here at Cambridge to do this kind of thing. Uh, the world is a changing place. I think we've probably learned more about infectious diseases in the last nine months than we have in the previous 10 years, haven't we? Especially how we accelerate treatments, develop vaccines and all of these things. And I think that we have not only um, a lot to offer, but also a lot to learn. And I think that, that only having those relationships with people working in places where not only can we learn things, but they can learn things in this interaction and we're going to move forward. I think that we're not the fountain of all knowledge. And I think there is a lot that we can do with partners from low middle income countries that actually we could learn from in the future with respect to pandemic controls, particularly, again, with antimicrobial resistance, my, one of my particular interests. And I think that um, there's a lot that then we can do intera with interaction with these places that there's we could offer we could offer a, a lot them more than what we're doing at the moment. Thank you. I, I echo both both those thoughts actually. And within the um, within the Fleming funded program we were discussing earlier, we've actually seen equal partnerships with leads both overseas and in the UK, and we've actually seen demonstrated benefits uh, brought back. Zambian colleagues, for example, taught. Uh, students at the University of Brighton and Sussex Medical School how to make hand rub and they used it in the NHS in Sussex uh, when there was a shortage here which was um, which was a really really good example. Um, Tom or Dame Sally did you have anything to add before we move on to the final question? I, I would add that it's based um, collaboration on uh, respect and trust uh, and that means you do have to get to know people and you have to lay out all the issues up front and debate them and work. Uh, and I think the best way of building respect and trust is doing a project together, as a matter of fact. But it has taken many of, of us time to learn how to play as equals and not in another way. And I think that was eloquently made by both um, Tom and Professor Hutchinson. Um, and, and if I may just to add to that as well, I think one of the things as that trust and honesty develops is a really clear articulation of what each party actually need out of these collaborations. So I think the defining moment of our Myanmar partnership was when the rector of the university stood up and said, I really need some papers out of this because I need to get some prestige for my university and so I need to publish something. And you think, well, that's fantastic because that's actually a very discrete target which we can all work together and it's all on the table and I think these things don't work when 
what one person needs is not clearly expressed to the rest of the partnership. And actually you can find a way of suiting everybody as long as you're very explicit about what has to come out of it, whether that's patient care improvement, writing a nice paper, getting the next tranche of funding or increasing the research capacity of your juniors. I agree with that, but also, but also just to add to that, I think that, that, that we're learning this as we go along. I, I think that the way the Global Health Initiative has been set over historically and to some extent is now has not been like that. I think it's very much been a one way partnership. And I think as Cambridge and the area moves forward in this direction to do something different, we can offer more equitable partnerships by not only um, doing something different, but perhaps also learning from the mistakes of ourselves and others in the past as well. Thank you. Um, we have another question coming up in just a second. But before that, um, Charlotte, please, could we have the second poll question? This is quite an interesting question. You should see that on your screen. And you've got 10 seconds or so to fill that in, if you may. Thank you very much. And we will move on to our final question. And then if there's time, I'll see if there's anything in the um, questions from the audience. Uh, final question for our panel. Within all the complexities we've already discussed all afternoon and last week, um, what, what do you see as your vision for how best practice can work in this space? Um, Tom, you're the only one unmuted, so I'm gonna pick on you. We'll start with you. Um, so for me, what needs to happen is that first of all, you need genuine institutional buy-in um, on both sides of the equation. So that's with your low income and your high income partners. And that has to come often really the highest level to make sure that things are facilitated and supported. Um, and once you've got that institutional buy-in, I think institutions have to accept that there's a degree of investment that must come with it if you want these things to work. So much of the global health work is in the relationship building and in the network building. And it's often the bit that is not funded by typical research programs and clinical improvement programs that they expect that work to be done. And so I think if institutions are serious about doing it well, they have to find core funding to facilitate their clinicians and their academics to build those relationships so they can do really good work. Um, and then finally, I think it's about, uh, and I think Rose alluded to this in the research panel, that the governance of working cross-culturally, particularly with LMICs, is such a minefield in terms of the ethical and the moral landscape, both in terms of the direct patient beneficiaries, but also how you relate to LMIC and high income researchers and clinicians that I think it's incumbent upon the high income settings to get their own governance in order, but then they have to work with their partners to make sure that's a governance framework that works for both. Uh, and it's kind of mutually agreed before you start. Um, so yeah, my answer is a lot about how you build the institution to try and help that. Thank you. Um, Dame Sally, do you have anything to add? I think Tom's put it very well, um, and we've been discussing this, so uh, I want to congratulate you um, on what you've done and what you're going to do. Keep going. This is not something, and I think you've all been saying that, that is built overnight. It takes time to build the relationships and how this can work. And I think we have, as a nation, moved on. I was very worried back in the early uh, noughties about how uh, people were going and um, bringing DNA samples and collections back to this country and all the country that they came from got out of it with a name on a paper. I think we've moved on from that, but we have to remember that we are all in this together and help people to grow to be our equals in the infrastructure as well. But well done, keep it up, and thank you. Thank you, and um, Peter or Steve? I mean, I, yeah, just as how do, how, do we, how do we go about it? What, what do we need? I, I think that just to go back to kind of my subject and also the, the subject of Sally around antimicrobial resistance. So we need new approaches. Uh, we have a lot of creative science, both in Cambridge and in the area. 
Uh, and actually maybe that the UK is not the main focus of where this science should be applied. And I think by having these interactions uh, in countries where they perhaps need more access to better diagnostic testing, to more equitable exposure or use of antimicrobials, or even new antimicrobials or new vaccines that could be provided, that, that I think that we have a, a conduit there to move technology into these places through collaboration to try and uh, you know, attack some of these things in the places where they're most needed. And I think that's what Cambridge can bring. I think we do have great innovation, just perhaps maybe the UK isn't maybe the best place where it can be applied. Thank you. Um, and we had one, I'm not sure if it was a question or if a comment really um, put in the Q&As, which was around the, the sheer numbers of um, people involved with the university uh, working in the UK and in Cambridge and in the east of England who are, who are from overseas who then return, um, how we can continue to engage or how they can continue to engage once they've returned uh, with projects uh, within our region. So that's po possibly something that we can all think about, um, how we can kind of galvanise on the, um, the interest in, in global health from people who've actually come from a different perspective to start with. There, there is something, Sarah, called, called intersurge, which is, it, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to say, but it's sort of Tinder for surgery. <laughs> where <Okay>. we, <laughs> where, where we, we do match people, but a lot of people who've gone back to these other countries. So it, it is like a site where people can match common interests across the world. And it's been fantastic in building these collaborations. And, and uh, uh, it's, it, that, that's, what it, that's what it has turned out to be. But it has, it's been absolutely amazing in, in, in terms of getting those links. So there are, there, are main, there are ways of doing that. Thank you. And I think we can probably put, share some of these um, uh, links and suggestions uh, with the people who've contributed to this conference as well. Um, I'm slightly conscious, uh, Dame Sally, you have another uh, meeting to go to shortly. Uh, so I think I might just probably uh, conclude this part of the panel discussion um, in the next sort of 30 seconds or so. Did anybody else have any final final thoughts? I, I'd just like to, I've, I've really, I think this has been absolutely fantastic, but I always sort of face with a challenge that we've done a lot, but for me, the challenge is how you get to the next stage, and that's policy implementation and how we convince governments to act on the findings that both ourselves and our partners have shown. And, that, and that's why this World Health Assembly was really interesting. And I, maybe Dame Sally could just comment, just how do we get to this next level beyond the science and the medicine to the policy? Um, yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to do that on a number of areas. It is about never taking no for an answer. It's about having the evidence ready, but it's about framing it in a way that it means something to them. Um, and I think that's back to how do you measure impact? What impact are they interested in? So in uh, Myanmar, they're going to be interested in how many accidents they have and what that does to young people and then to their economy or to families falling into poverty. So you start to frame it around what are they worrying about? And this is part of the solution, but um, it's tough. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dame Sally, and indeed all our panellists. And I think the take home from that is never take no for an answer. I think my, um, my children all seem to already have that message. Uh, uh, I certainly think it's a great message. Uh, so we will, we will go forward with that one. And um, maybe we should all go. Um, I think on that note, we will conclude the panel discussion. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for your contributions. We've, we've learned an incredible amount. Um, I think there have been some, possibly some other questions and comments in the boxes. So if you've been posting these, um, if anyone's been posting these, we will, we will get back to you on them. Uh, and I think now I'm going to move on to Susie, 
who will uh, who will sum up the two days of our conference last week and this week uh, using Mural. If you're there, Susie. I am here, I'm here. Hang on one second, I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you. And uh, just rapidly uh, finishing off a couple of the fantastic outputs from today. Amazing, amazing conference. And I so appreciate um, all of your thoughts. So here we go. Share this. OK. So what I'm sharing right now is um, a mural that uh, captures not only the ninth, but also the 19th content and high level themes um, from all of the rich, rich content that has come out of this conference. Um, it will be available to have all the participants uh, throughout the weekend so that you can add in anything we've missed. And my job was really just to share with you how to navigate this and also kind of summarize some of the top level themes that have come out since the ninth and throughout today. So if you look at a mural when you come into it, at the very top there is a, an outline mode. And when you click on that outline, you get a list of the various things that went on during this conference. The first of which is what I'm going to talk about now, which is the actual themes, high level themes. And I'm just gonna briefly go through those. Um, Number one, equitable partnerships needs to be fit for a purpose and working together really supports and reduces those inequities. And reminder that there's a mural to add more of your thoughts around equitable partnerships and what those barriers and supports are. So that mural I believe is being posted in the chat once again. If you haven't had the opportunity, please do over the next couple days, add your thoughts. Um, secondly, international co collaborations. These have come up a number of times, both around ant antiretrovirals and um, just gonna, there we go. Um, and, and really it starts local and then broadens to international collaborations. And the theme that came up over and over again was that there are clear links between our planet health and our personal health. And in order to address those links, another theme that came up was the decolonization, decolonization of research and how important that is. And then uh, we talked a, a lot of a lot of the speakers spoke about connecting both inwardly and communicating outwardly. And this is a really challenging thing, obviously, because we have so many moving parts and the complexity is so difficult. And so one of the big themes that came up on the ninth was we need and are putting in place frameworks and processes that are adaptable so that we can actually make some of the invisible more visible. And really, we need to come at this from the perspective of what am I bringing and what can I learn versus what do I get? And that really enables those effective partnerships that the panel was just speaking about. So for some reason it is pausing right now. There we go. So um, lastly, understanding uh, Tom, brought up a lot of great um, stories about impact and how we really need to understand the meanings and the consequences. And we heard that a lot on the ninth as well. Um, and really understanding not only impact, but capacity building and how capacity building means different things to different people. And so we need to really listen in and we need to bring in thinking differently and part of that, that we heard over and over again today in the panel groups, but also on the ninth, was the 
exponential impact of train the trainer programs. These can be incredibly powerful in actually the final sort of theme, which was focusing on this improving care. We really need to stay focused on that improving care goal. And in order to do that, we need to never take no for an answer. Thank you, Dame Sally. And uh, collaboration and how um, thinking differently starts at home and then spreads globally. So those were some of the top highlighted themes. Um, we had uh, a number of other more detailed discussions, and I'm just going to take you through the outline so that when you come into this mural, you have some sense of the depth and richness of what this conference has inspired, and hopefully it will help continue those collaborations. So on the 9th, we started with Amanda Howe and how, it, how prim, uh, global primary care relates to public health. And it really is the cornerstone of equitable global health. And the reason for that was because GPs are so closely tied to um, the community. So they have the ability to really help us understand the real relevant needs at a local level. We then looked at a number of examples, including today's, these were the pink were all from the ninth, including today's Peter Hutchinson, amazing talk on the four themes around neurotrauma and how those themes could really help us in other realms of collaborating for impact. We also saw challenges. So there's a whole section on challenges where we had some of the themes of invisible, invisible threats and the connections between um, anti, antiviral uh, drug resistance as well as um, the planet and our planet health. So lastly, today we had the breakout groups we have much more detail on this, but these are some of the high level breakout themes from today. They're here, please add in. We also had Collaborating for Impact. Tom had an amazing um, talk and we have these questions you can add in, any additional questions we missed here. And the poll question answers from the entire group will be added before the end of today. And lastly, we had a beautiful um, conversation from Dame Sally Davies and really understanding health as our greatest asset and how we need to depersonalize data and giving us new metaphors. So some of the themes from the panel discussions were captured here. There are many more, please add in your questions and answers. And in terms of next steps, um, this mural will be available and the three murals I mentioned earlier. So we've got the Equitable Partnerships mural, we've got the Landscape mural, and then this mural that I just shared. Please continue to, um, to add in your participant additions via post-its or pictures. And we will definitely be sending these out to you in final form once it closes after the 23rd. So thank you very much for all your rich content and back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Susie. Um, so I think without further ado, I will hand to Evelyn for the closing remarks of the conference. Is that, is that what you're expecting, Evelyn? <laughs> it is, thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Yes, and thank you for doing a fantastic job chairing because um, it's, it's a difficult job to chair any session, but I think chairing a session when you're trying to look um, at people on a screen, trying to sense who wants to speak next, trying to work, look at your WhatsApp group and look at everything that's going on. And you've, yeah, you've done it fantastically. So thank you very much. Um, I think, it, I mean, it's amazing to see what uh, Susie just showed us, the extent of the discussions that have taken place 
in actually not many hours in that the session on the ninth was a couple of hours and today we've had what have we had three and a half hours um, and it's extraordinary how much depth of discussion is there and I think the challenge I suppose for us now is how do we continue these correct conversations and continue to build these collaborations and and I guess continue to to push um, what we haven't yet done is run the final poll so if we can run the final poll now um, and then we'll close Great, thank you. So yes, um, all that's left for me to say is to thank um, everybody for joining, to thank everybody um, who, who spoke, who's, who's posed questions. And yeah, please can we continue this? And um, something that I've just been seeing that's coming up at the moment is we spoke, you know, the WHO kind of rallying cry, how do we build back better? And now people are beginning to talk about also building back equal, um, which is so true, isn't it? Um, and so so necessary. And so hopefully a lot of the conversations we've had in this conference have been about that, about equitable about collaborations, about equal um, conversations, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think we, we're headed in the right direction and I feel really positive about that, but it takes us all to pull together. Um, and one way in which we can do that, particularly in this slightly distant world that we're currently living in, but that actually is really great because anybody from anywhere can join if they have access um, to the internet, which is another challenge, of course, but we, if we can continue to collaborate on the mural, continue to collaborate on Slack, get in touch with each other via email, then we can build. So I, I really hope that you will all take some time to continue to engage in that. And then that will inform what we do with it next. So as a working group with the, the Public Health IRC, with the Neurotrauma Group, we will make decisions about what we then do with that mural. How do we continue to use it to, to, to build collaborations for impact across Cambridge and across the um, East of England region? So I hope you all have a good evening. And I look forward to seeing you at other meetings and certainly at the next conference um, in years to come. So thank you, everybody. Goodbye.